So I, <laughs> I like how Pastor Roger says he thinks I'm fitting to give this story and uh, to give this sermon. I think this is something God's had on my heart for a while, and I think it's, uh, I'm excited to share it. I think this is, this is a huge message. So let me, let me tell you the name of it. It is, What Are You Storing in Your Heart? What are you storing in your heart? And uh, we're going to be talking about what, what our life looks like. What our life looks like. If you all have been here the last several weeks, you've heard Pastor John talking about acts of worship. Our worship in music this morning, right? That kind of worship, where we should be, that we should be centered, we should be with God. Uh, we, we know God has music worship. It's one of the power, most powerful things in the Bible that we can do actively with him um, beyond praying. And, uh, <clears throat> and then the next week, a couple weeks later, he talked about the gifts of the Spirit, right? And they are for today, and they're active, and they're well. And God's got a different gift for everybody, right? So just because I have one gift doesn't mean everybody should have it, right? And so um, it's kind of like, I look at it this way, like it's cool to get a good, cool birthday present. Most birthday presents are bought. But it would, it's not as cool if everybody in the same neighborhood had the exact same thing, right? So God knows that, and he knows how to keep us cherishing things. Um, but where it all comes down to is why, why is worship so important? Why are the gifts of the Spirit so important? It's obedience. And here's what's, here's what's interesting about obedience. There's a difference between obligation and obedience. Okay? Thanks. Can I get an amen on that? So here's the thing is, is when we are obedient, it's stemmed from love. Right? Um, we, we, can, we can be in conformance, which we think looks a lot like obedience, right? And so conformance typically comes if I've got a whip and I'm beating you, right? You, you'll do what I want, but it's because I'm making you conform. And that's why in marriage we always tell people, don't conform, don't compromise, resolve, right? And so, so there's a big difference. And, and obligation comes from... Uh, Fulfilling the action despite our heart, right? And, and sometimes that's all we have <laughs> is some obligation. But really what God wants is our obedience. And he wants it because it stems from love. All God wants is our love. He wants us, all of us, our, our love. And listen, there's, this is what's so incredible. His love's here for us constantly. He loves you. And so all these things John talks about stems around the heart, right? The condition of the heart. And when we truly begin to understand the love God has for us, we begin to understand his mercy and his grace. And then we begin to understand what it means to love. And I know you guys have heard me say this probably a million times. You really don't know love unless you know Jesus. That's just the truth. We think we do. And that's why, you know, it's hard not to get upset at the world, right, with some of the things that we see going on. But it's like I told someone, I said, listen, I can't hold non-Christians to my standards. I can't hold people to love the way I love if they don't know Jesus. Right? And so all I can do is do what God asked me to do, and that's to love. And there's a lot with these gifts. Listen, these gifts that God's given us are things to not only build the body, but to bring the unbeliever in, to point them towards the cross. God's love is really all we need. Do you have the picture of the Bible? I'm going to show you guys something. Well, I'll show that one picture with the finger first, the finger one, yep. So, listen, this is how I think we understand love and obedience. That little speck. That's my, yeah, that's my. <laughs> that's my <laughs> so, that's how much we under, that's how much, like when we look at God's love, that's how we view it. Like, yeah, that's love, right? We look at the things that God asks us of, uh, 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 asks of us as Christians, and we kind of look at it like a speck, right? Like, but here's the thing. There's an analogy here. That is a Bible. That is the whole Bible. That's called the Nano Bible. It's only a hundred atoms thick. Yeah. So, it's the whole Bible. So think if we magnify that, you'd have the whole Bible. See, we often think we can grab the concepts of things, and we think, hey, I've got that covered. It's just this little topic. 
But as we dive in, we begin to learn more. Right? And we begin to understand. And that's how God's love works. The more we love people, the more we love God, not works, love, the more he reveals his love to us. And the more we understand it, the more grace and mercy we give, the more we receive. And why is this big? Because, listen, obedience is key to that. Because obedience in love is what drives us when we don't want to go. Right? When we don't want to go talk to that neighbor because they might think we're a fruit loop. When we, when, hey, it's the truth. When we, right, Matt? No. <laughs> I love you, brother. Uh, <laughs> I, have, I have good neighbors. Um, but here's the thing. I don't think they think I'm good. But anyways, uh, here's the thing. As we do this, when God wants us to give of ourselves, give of ourselves, or give up, what, what happens when I'm supposed to have a date with my wife and I'm going to take her to Prime, no, Prime Quarters are good, right? I don't like to go there for a date because it's cooking and that doesn't seem right to me. So uh, we went, what's the name of that place? Samba. We went to Samba for a date. But you want to know something? What happens if God told me as I'm going to Samba, give that man all your money for your date? See, obedience is what kicks in. I love the Lord and I fear him enough to be obedient. And what is that? That's a, that's a resemblance of my heart. See, God gave us the fruit. We always say, well, you can't judge someone. God gave us fruit to look at things, to kind of give a good indication of what we're doing. And so what I'm going to be talking about is, I think, the biggest problem in America, I think it probably accounts for why 60% of the sin's out there. And it's money. And the condition of our heart when it comes to money, and specifically, I'm going to be talking about tithing. Whoa, did you guys hear that? That was like some of the Swiss I heard the seat covers, and Abe Lincoln <laughs> screaming. Norwegians were the same. I was about ready to pass out. Well, calm down. Listen. <laughs> I don't know what made me say that. <laughs> yeah, it's a little switch for a while. That's for sure. No, anyways. Uh, listen, I'm not going to, I'm not here to tell you how to spend your money. The truth is, it's not yours anyways. So, uh, here's, here's what I know. I'm going to back up a little bit. God treasures you. You know how I know that? You know how I know God treasures you? His word. And you know, this, this sticks out, this kind of rang for me. Matthew 6, 21, it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, for where your treasure is, there also will be your heart. Okay? If we examined and audited God's life, well, it has no beginning end, if we audited God and we looked at him and I tried looking for his treasures, where has he put all his resources? He put all his resources on us. He treasures us. And so his heart is with us. His heart is pursuing us because all his resources, his only son, his creation, all his efforts. We often think of God like he's like only dealing with us when we're awake. He's only dealing with us during this time. God is in it 24-7 everywhere. He is actively involved with us. Now, much like a parent doesn't mean why he's got away, right? But he treasures you. And this is what treasuring means. To be treasured means to be carefully valued. The question is, what do you treasure? If God audited your life, where would he find your treasures? Where would we, in end, find your heart? Is it the pub down the street? Is it the season tickets at the Badgers? Is it work? 
Is it your wife? Is it your children? Is it God? Is it Jesus? Listen, I'm not saying the tickets are a bad thing or the pub down the street is a bad thing. Hopefully it's got food and that's why you're going there. But if not, we'll talk later. But it's the condition of our heart. It's, it's what we hold in high regard. Here's, I, I think I may have shared this one other time, and I know we had a men's gathering, right? And I had a gentleman who I, I didn't know come up to me, and he says, hey, how, how can you collect cars when there's hungry people in the world? Yeah. And so it didn't hurt me at all, guys. Everything I have is it's done in prayer. But I told him, I said, because I have an eternal mindset. I said, you know, it's interesting, and, and this gentleman, who I, d- I figured out who it was afterwards, and what's ironic is the sale of one of my cars had actually paid one of his medical bills, right? And so I'm not saying this to boast or anything. What I'm saying is that's the eternal mindset. Mary and I, everything we do, we pray, and we seek God because I do believe there are weird things that have eternal... Listen, God's ways are so much higher than ours. God can use a stupid race up the side of a mountain to bring people up to him. Hopefully you're all it, praying for me and subscribe fast as pastor. Um, <laughs> but God's big, and his ways are higher than ours, but I have seen him use things that I did not think he would use. He used a poor boy who started a business in a tin shed to build a business where non-Christians can see the love of Christ and where some of them can come to know Christ. That's the biggest thing. I can tell you the best thing that's ever happened in my business is when one of my workers has accepted Jesus. That's better than anything. But back to tithing, (laughs) the most popular subject from the pulpit ever. So why, why do we even talk about tithing? Pastor Don, why, why is it? Listen, it's an eternal concept. Tithing came into the scene before covenant and law. Okay, so you don't get to throw it out. In fact, we can't even throw really the law because if you look at what Jesus says, it's because I didn't come to abolish the law. He didn't. He didn't come to abolish the law, but to make the law known. He upped the standard. Did you notice that with the law? What used to be murder was read, 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 read. Now it's I hate, and that's considered murder too, right? Back in the law days, adultery was I had to lay with another woman. Now it's I just have to look at her lustfully, and it's adultery. He upped the standard of the law because God is so good. Jesus is so good. And so outside of that, we have tithing. Tithing happened before and after that. So it doesn't get abolished, new covenant, old covenant, law, pre-law, whatever. It's an eternal concept, and we see that because it's brought up in Genesis. Genesis 14, we see Abraham, okay, he comes back, back from the spoils of labor, and, and, and we, can, we can open that. I should probably follow my notes. So, actually, I skipped like three pages. Are you guys cool with that if I just tell you some verses really quick? So look at Genesis, look at Genesis okay? And this is what we're going to do. This, this is why I want to say this. I want to say this. Look at Genesis 1, Okay? When you go home, look at Genesis 1. What I want you to do is look at Cain and Abel. First, look at God created. God created what? The birds of the air and the creatures of the sea, right? Genesis tells us that. And it also says it creates all the fruits and spoils on the earth. Now, Cain and Abel come, and Abel does what? He offers a sacrifice to God. It was his first fruits. Okay, so the concept of giving God back what was rightfully his, he did this as a sign of worship because he loved God. Cain did it out of obligation. Abel did it out of obedience. What happened? The heart won out. Abel gave it to God. Great. Cain's heart won out. It was evil. He did out of obligation. He didn't care about thanking God for what he had. Everything at that time comes from God. It all was from God, right? It was his fields, his creation, everything. Abel was like, God, I just want to thank you for what I've gotten. Okay? So that's Genesis 1, Genesis 4. Let's skip to 14. This is where we see the first thing come tithe in, okay? And this is Abraham, and I'm going to go quick because I don't have a lot of time. In Genesis 14, it says, After Abraham returned from defeating, yeah, Ketololamer, 
don't have a clue. And the kings <laughs> allied with him. The king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shevev. That is the king's valley. Then Meshledek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God the Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Okay? Then it goes on. It says, hey, listen, you keep, you keep the spoils. I want the people. And Abram said, listen, I'm not taking anything from you, king. I promised God you wouldn't. So Abraham did a few things with tithing here. Number one is, well, let's now switch to Hebrews. I'm going to help. We're going to have the Bible, interpret the Bible. How's that sound? So now we go, so that's, that's Old Testament. Now let's go to the New Testament, Hebrews 7. Okay, so let's flip to Hebrews 7. Hattie, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hang in there with me. Um, here, this is Meshledek, was the king of Salem and the priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melche Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means the king of peace, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning or end of their life, resembling the son of God. And he remains a priest forever. So this was like not an allegory, but a, a shadowing. I had to call John yesterday. <laughs> this is a shadowing. I couldn't think of the word. Actually, he called me. That's actually how it works. You called me, and I said, hey, I was going to call you. But he called me just to pray for me. He's a good brother. Um, and I said, hey, what's this call? He says, that's a shadowing. Listen. That was a shadowing of our relationship with God, with our relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? And all it's saying is, listen, Abraham and what he did is a shadowing of what we are supposed to continue to do, and how much more so. Here they talk about it because how much more so are we supposed to do it? Because Jesus is greater than that king was. So that also sets the standard where, now, disclaimer, this is Don's belief. I believe a tenth is bare minimum. Because God's greater. If a minimum of tenth, if, if God's greater than that tenth, then there should be more than a tenth. Okay? And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit about tithe and offering. We'll get to that in a minute. It's minimum. Okay? You guys with me? So that's tithing. Tithing means to give a 10% of whatever you need. That, the word in it, it actually means treasured tenth. That's pretty, pretty miraculous if you think about that. And here's the thing. You're not giving it up. That's what I, I think that's why it's such a condition of the heart. That's why Jesus talks about riches so much. And we see it in the Bible. And we saw Abraham doing it because, listen, God knew Abraham. This was, this was just the beginning of riches he saw. And, and he knew, God knew that if Abraham learned this now, his heart would not get deceived like the world's is today. We value money so much. And I get it. We need money to pay bills, right? Man, I don't know about you, but we stop paying the gas bill, they're coming to shut it off, right, bro? I mean, I don't get to say, well, Jesus has got me. <laughs> I can pray about it and say, Jesus, I really hope you got me, and hopefully a fellow brother shows up with some money or sister, right? But what I'm saying is, the world don't care if Jesus got me. So I get that. But what we're talking about is our hearts. I can't change the world's hearts unless my heart's changed. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? So... How much greater is God than this king? Huge. Right? So we see tithing at last, beginning to end. It's an eternal concept. Can you guys say that? Eternal concept. So here's what I want you to do. Before I go too much farther, I want you to pull out a 3 by 5 card. There should be a 3 by 5 card in the, front of, in the back of every seat. You guys could help each other out. Everybody good? Here's what I'd like you to do. I didn't ask Pastor, so I'm really hoping this is okay. But I did, John and I consulted about it a while back, and I thought, man, that's a good idea. What I want you to do is write down, no, I'm just kidding. This is what I want you to do. I was going to say something funny, and it's not funny. Um, <laughs> it's just the truth. I caught myself. <laughs> is that a sign of maturity? <laughs> nah, I told about it, so it's immature. Anyways. On this, listen, whether you're tithing or not, this is what I, is interesting for me. I would like you to write on this card, whether you're tithing or not, maybe when you weren't tithing or maybe you're not tithing, why aren't you? Right? Is it, is it the fact that 
how am I supposed to give God 10% when I can't even make ends meet? Or I'm fearful that maybe I won't have that money next week. Or, hey, I didn't tithe because I just didn't know. Or my heart wasn't there. Whatever it may be, can you just take a minute and write down that reason on your card? Don't put your name on it. Just write the reason of why maybe you didn't tithe in the past. Maybe you've tithed since day one. Great. Then write down why you do tithe. Okay, so that's the second half of this card is why do you tithe if you're there? So if you could write that out, that'd be great. I'm going to continue on while you're doing that, so hopefully you can listen. So we're going to look also, there's a really good principle in 2 Chronicles I like, 2 Chronicles 31. I'm just going to kind of break it down for you really quick, but keep that as your note, 2 Chronicles 31. This is contributions of worship. What happens is Hezekiah was assigned to the priests and Levites of the division. They come, all right, and each of them, according to their duties and priests of Levites, to offer burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to minister, to give thanks and sing priests to gates of the Lord's dwelling. So basically what's happened is Hezekiah comes in later in this and says, listen, you guys need to tithe. And why are you tithing? Because you need to tithe for the priests and the Levites. Okay, so today's equivalents are you guys and us as pastors. You need to tithe to them so they can uphold the law of the Lord. Did you catch that? So they can uphold the law of the Lord. So the second part of a tithe is God uses it. Listen, he doesn't want your money. He doesn't need your money. He wants your obedience in your heart. So get that straight. But he can use that to do things in the kingdom. And what, what is amazing here is when, when Hezekiah, the king, sends that out, it says immediately everybody took to doing it. And then you go down later in 31 and it says even, even people that weren't commanded to do it did it and they did it more abundantly. Well, we're supposed to uphold the law of the Lord as well. And the law of love. Well, with 300 people here, we can't do that with nothing. There's only so far we can go. And unfortunately, again, we live in that world, right? We live in a fallen world. Money has to be part of it. But money is a good thing. The love of money is the root of all evil. I cannot stand when people misquote that. Oh, well, money is the root of all evil. <laughs> Read your word. The love of money is the root of all evil. And that's why. What, what are we grabbing onto that's so much greater than God? Right? And so I like that in Second Chronicles 31. Now the meat and potatoes of the message with 15 minutes left. Really only 10 because we have a response song. How's that sound? Okay. Am I making sense? Okay, I just want to make sure. So we have established tithing is a biblical thing. We've established that it's a resource that we need to uphold the law of the Lord. Not only the law of the Lord, but the law of love. The greatest, greatest of these, the greatest commandment is love. And how do we do that? Through the church. And how do we do that through the church? By sending you guys out, equipping you guys, and equipping the church. Okay? How do we, how do, we do that? It all starts with our heart. Right? And I think, of that, I think of that story where the woman gave, like, how much was it, John? Like, a couple pennies, right? A couple pennies, is that what you said? A couple pennies, and that was weighted bigger than anything a rich king could give because of her heart, right? And so we go back to Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Hattie, here we are. This is, in case you guys have never noticed, Matthew 6 and Matthew 9 are my favorite, one of my favorite, they're like my top 10 books in the Bible, okay? Chapters, not books, chapters, okay? Do not store up yourselves treasures, 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 I just looked at Trevor, do not, we probably shouldn't store up Trevor's either because, <laughs> I love you bro, do not store up yourself treasures on earth where moss and vermins can destroy it, and where thieves break in and steal, click, but store up your, yourselves treasures in heaven where moss and vermins do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Listen, God is eternal-minded. This is a great reminder of it, right? Let's go back to the first verse of that. Okay? Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moss and vermins can destroy. This is a good thing that you could use to remind yourself, am I being eternal-minded? What am I going for? Can this be destroyed? My cars, vermins, and moss can eat those. 
Okay? It can be destroyed. It can get burnt up. Thieves can steal it. But you know what can't be is me taking to a car show and sharing the love of Jesus with people and preaching the gospel. My treasure is not in the car. It's what that gains me access to for the kingdom. Are you picking up what I put down? Everything can have eternal minded if we're seeking God the Father. He will only allow you to do what is right for him in heaven. He does, listen, y'all are looking at me when I'm going to say this because I know I get it. When I started my business and me and my wife together, there were times we went without food. Without food. I'm not talking about like we thought it would be a good idea to diet. We're talking we didn't go for food because we had to feed our kids. And we were scared. And we were hungry. And we were on our knees. Listen, I know what it is to be in want and in need. And you know what's funny is Yes, we've, I, I don't have to worry about that near as much. I still have to worry about it. Just, now it's just a big boom if things go wrong and it's over really quickly. But <laughs> the honest truth is, when I look back, God is eternal minded. And you want to know something? He always meets our needs. We look in the Bible and it says, look at the lilies of the field, how, how extravagant. And again, we're in six, right? Six is a great chapter. Read it. Go home and read it. Read it every day this week. It's a great reminder of the things that God will do for us. But we all got to admit this. I want to see a show of hands. How many of you have been more blessed by God meeting a need versus a want? Yeah. Amen, right? Because he know, it's just funny. Like, we just, I'm a human, and I'll admit it. But when God meets a need, it's so much greater in my heart than him meeting a want. And so when he, I see him meet, meeting the needs of others, people need Jesus. People need Jesus. I need to have the heart of Christ in me to bring forth the message of the gospel to them. That's just how it goes. So if we look at what is eternal minded, there's only a few things that we can take to heaven. One is our souls. The second is relationships with fellow believers. And thirdly is our treasures. When we do something in the kingdom in Jesus' name and there's a treasure in heaven, it's held for us. Even if we walk away and go to hell, that that treasure is still there. Those are three things. That's it. Not money. Vermin, destroy, burn up, steal. Not our houses, not our cars, not our clothes. I always think of Pastor Roger's story where they laid their clothes out and made it look like the rapture came back (laughs) every time I... Anyhow, great, great, great trick. Um, not all, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good to know. <laughs> Kept your underwear on. But we were warned from Christ not to store up things here on earth, but to store up the things that are in heaven. And the things that are in heaven are God's works, those things that we can receive the treasures of heaven for. I look at Pastor John and Pastor Roger and Pastor Kent and I often tell them when you're in heaven and you're sitting in your mansion and you open the door and all the treasures run out the front door, come visit me at my shack. But I'm trying. But we are blessed to have men of God. And what I want to see for you guys is an eternity that we all live on the same street lined with treasures because we're doing what God called us to do and we're bringing people to Christ, leading them to Christ for eternal salvation. So let's get back to tithing and the heart. It's all God's. Now I didn't always tithe. I had a gentleman by the name of Chris Bauer who taught me a hard lesson in tithing. Um, we were, I had been a Christian for a while and he said, hey, I noticed when the offering plate goes by. That's the nice thing about the offering plate, I guess. <laughs> Which now we don't have, maybe. <laughs> Anyways, I was going to say something funny. It wasn't funny. Um, I remember, and this is what he told me. He says, hey, I noticed you keep passing the offering plate by. I'm like, yeah. You love Jesus, don't you? I said, yeah. 
He says, how much? I said, I'd give anything for him. He says, you're a liar. I'm like, what? He's like, well, obviously you can't even give 10% of what's his. So you won't give anything. You're giving nothing. And I thought, oh, man. He's like, listen. And he pointed me to Scripture, right? He pointed me to Scripture and said, listen, you need to learn about tithing. I just was ignorant, right? I mean, I remember reading in the Bible, but I didn't really get it, right? And so I read it, and I remember the following week he comes up to me, and I passed the offering plate by <laughs> and sunk in. I'm not the brightest bulb in the drawer. And I remember he come up to me after church, and he's like, listen, you need to tithe. He says, I, God told me that you need to tithe everything in your pockets. Now, he doesn't know, but I just got done flipping a guy's four-wheeler backwards down a hill, brand spanking new. So I was paying that, right, trying to pay that off to him. And uh, the guy didn't ask me to. I just felt like I should. It was the right thing to do. <laughs> I had no money. I remember I reached in my pocket. I had 20 bucks. That was it. Now, I had to drive 60 miles each way to work. Payday wasn't for five more days. And I said, this is all I got. I said, this is all I got for food. My, and he says, is your gas tank full? I said, yep, it's full. I said, but it won't quite last me the whole week. And he's like, I don't care. He says, God says, put it all on the, all the plate. and He'll meet every need. So I put it in the plate. And I was scared. Worship team, why don't you guys come up? And I was scared. I remember going home and, like, I didn't have a whole lot to eat. I was a bachelor. You know, I don't know if you know this, but, like, a bachelor's pantry is, like, cereal, milk, and maybe some beef jerky. <laughs> And so I, had, I ran through that pretty quick. But what was amazing is on Tuesday night, this lady from the church brought me a pan of lasagna. And, she's, and she came to my house. I didn't even know if she knew where I lived. And she's like, hey, Don, God told me to make you a pan of lasagna. Now, I'm Italian. <laughs> Sicilian, which is a little bit better. Um, <laughs> you want to speak to my heart? Feed me. <laughs> All right? If you want to be my friend, come eat with me. Eating with me is sacred. But she made this pan of lasagna. And every step of the way, I was able to eat that lasagna every day the rest of the week, right? Thursday came around, I was about empty on gas, and I walked into work, and I'm like, I don't even know how I'm getting home. And the front receptionist, Jennifer, I won't forget her name, she's like, hey, Don. I'm like, what? She's like, hey, I just was cleaning out my desk. She says, I got this old gas card. You want it? She's like, I think it's got like maybe 10 bucks on it. I'm like, yeah, I'll take it. And so I shared with her like what was going on in my life. And she's like, oh, I never even thought about that. She was a Christian and had never tithed either, right? And so we talked about that. Well, I went to the gas station, put 10 bucks in, threw the card in there, and it says your balance is $190. Now listen, that wasn't the blessing I received. That's the problem. This world has taught us that if I put money in, give God back what is rightfully his, if I give back that 10%, that somehow I'm going to be blessed with money. That wasn't the blessing. You know what I was so thankful for that week? Was the fact that this lady from church who barely knew me went out of her way to listen to God, obedient to God, made me lasagna, Sicilian, and that I got to share with a lady at work about tithing, who obviously God was working on her as well. And that's all I could think about on my way home on Friday night. With tears running out of my eyes saying, God, what have I held? And I know I shared a story with you guys. God showed me some people that weren't tithing or tithing what they should be. First time I ever got a vision like this. And it was them. And, and one couple had the combination. The other couple didn't. But nonetheless, they opened this safe. And one of them took everything out of the safe. And the other part of them just took too much. There was supposed to be some left. And when they turned around and shut the safe door, it said God. And there was this fog and this haze. And in it, it said spiritual blessings. See, because of where they were at with their tithing, God had spiritual blessings he wanted to give them. Look at the spiritual blessing he gave Abraham. Listen, two chapters later, the covenant's established. Look at Hebrews and the command that was going on there and what they did. Look at Chronicles and look at what they did. You guys, if you want to see God move in your lives and in your hearts, get the right perspective. Start loving him through action of your heart by loving him and being obedient to him. You don't get saved by that. And that's why I find it interesting. 
that we often want to just make it tangible, like, oh, all your bills will pay, life is, listen, that's a bunch of garbage. But he'll meet your needs. And I promise you'll be more thankful for that. And you want to know why some people have more than others? I don't know. And you don't know either. But I do believe in some cases, God puts us at different levels because of where our hearts are at and how much we can be entrusted with. And that's just, listen, it's not good, bad, or indifferent. It's God loving us where we're at. But he wants to call us higher and he wants to call us bigger. And so the tithe is a resemblance of your heart. And so my charge to you this morning is, where are your treasures? If God audited your life, would your treasure be in your pocketbook? Or would it be in your neighbor's? Or would it be at the lost on the street corner? Or would it be at being a good person at work and working as though unto Jesus? Amen? Why don't we stand? I just, I'm just cutting it short there. I think God's got his, got his, I got his point across the hope. If you guys could take those cards and hand them inward, that would be great. You just quickly take those cards, and we're just going to sing really quick here. But You know what's interesting is in the Bible, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. It's funny he's compared to that because here's the thing about God. With the bread of life, you have to take these ingredients, and you have to meld them together. So you take these ingredients, we mix them together, right? We take all these different attributes, yeast and flour and egg and everything else, right? Uh, ushers, if you come around, pick them up and then collect them for me. That'd be great. And then we take this dough, and what do we do? We beat it, right? And we press it, and we roll it out, and then we form it into the loaf that we want it to be. And then we put it in a pan, and we let it sit. And we let the yeast work up. And then when the yeast becomes dead, we fire it, baking it. And then after we bake it, it comes out of the oven, and guess what? It gives life to people. It feeds them. Man, that's what Jesus did for you. That's what Jesus wants to do. That's why they say, give until it hurts. Because God wants to press you. He's given you ingredients. He's made every single one of you the way you are, perfectly. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to change who you are. He wants to show you who he made you to be. And so sometimes that comes with pressing and being rolled out and being shaped. And that's not fun. And then we're put in that pan. And sometimes we let this sit. And God's like, just listen. Just grow here in this. And then when it comes times of firing, we don't get burnt. We don't get useless. We become useful and are able to give people life through Jesus Christ. Through our ministry of our testimony. This is my desire to honor you. Just put your heart out. And with all my heart, worship you. haven't been in a place where your heart is able to give, whether it be tithing, whether it be of yourself, whether it be resources or surrendering. God is here. And He wants to call you in. And if you don't know Him, please grab one of us pastors. But he died for you. Sinless. Raising three days later to defeat our death. Overcoming it all. 
so that we may know life more abundantly. Listen, there's no amount of work. It don't matter how much you put in an offering plate. If you don't know Jesus, it does you no good. It's useless. So my charge to you guys is your pastor, one of your pastors, is love him. Get right in your heart. Spend this week. Read chapter 6 of Matthew. God has so much for us, and he loves you. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you for who you are. God, that you, you are the pursuer of our hearts. God, I pray that may you work in my heart, may you work in each one of our hearts to the degree in which we understand what Paul says when I consider it all rubbish compared to the glory of you, God, to the purpose of the cross. God, may we be a church that is known for its giving heart, for its obedient heart, for its lovely heart in the name of Jesus. May tomorrow morning, may we look like we do right now. And Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday, the image of you being poured into you. In your precious and mighty name, everybody said? Amen. God bless you guys. Sorry I ran late. We love you. God loves you.